be on at 12.05, I believe. She said 9.05 okay. Eastern time, but I just confirmed. I think she meant Pacific time, which be 12.05. Yeah, okay. Um, so, but our next speaker is there, so we can go ahead yeah. and start. So she, she said to look for her at five after. All right, all right. I just wanted to be sure. Uh, so I think we have like one minute. So uh, uh, Guan Shi from the University of Texas, uh, you're on if I understand, at least you're listed in the participants. Yeah, uh, I'm on. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. And Kelly is also ready. Yep, you're queued up. All right. So then I think uh, we can go ahead and start uh, with the next speaker, uh, Quan Chi uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. He's gonna talk about from high sea contact map uh, to three dimensional organization of interphase uh, human chromosomes. Uh, my name is Guang Shi. I'm a postdoc from Dave Thurman High School at UT Austin. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to talk about our work. Today, I'm going to present some results on reconstruction of 3D genome organization. Uh, we recently put this work on BioArchive as well. Uh, if you are interested, you can check it out. Uh, our goal here is to develop a computational method to reconstruct a three-dimensional genome organization from experiment data. Uh, we want our model to be able to reproduce the experiment measurement, uh, the, in this case, the high seed uh, contact map. And then it also should be able to capture the, uh, the heterogeneity in the uh, genome organization as well. Uh, currently, the most used experiment technique for studying genome organizations is high seed. Uh, presumably, the high C uh, experiment captures a, a, a contact event where two genomic loci come into proximity. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a typical contact map uh, from high sea experiment where each element uh, represents the contact frequency of relative contact probability between a pair of loci, PIJ. However, in order to have a three-dimensional structure, we need to know the uh, distance between them, RIJ, uh, or at least the mean value of that, which is noted as, uh, as a bracket notation here. So the power law, uh, the sorry, the polymer physics told us that uh, there is actually a power law relation between uh, contact probability PIJ and the mean pairwise distance RIJ, uh, given by this relation, where the value of alpha uh, depends on the nature of the system. It's, this suggests that uh, we can use this power law relation to convert uh, the high C contact map to the, to a distance map. However, there is a, a problem associated with that. Uh, due to the heterogeneity of cell population. Uh, here, uh, this is an example where there are two uh, sub-population, uh, A and B, uh, among the ensemble cells uh, in the high experiment. Um, so in population A, the distribution of the distance between uh, two loci, I and J, is given by uh, the blue curve, and the yellow curve uh, is the same distribution, uh, but for population B. Uh, within each subpopulation, the power law relation between Rij and Pij uh, still holds. However, if you look at the whole population, uh, this power law relation does not hold anymore. Uh, we show this in our previous work where we demonstrate that uh, uh, there is actually a extensive heterogeneity among cell population uh, in terms of its uh, genome, uh, genome structures and uh, it it is a reason why there's a discrepancy between high C contact probability and the uh, distance measurement from fish experiment. Uh, in this work, uh, we show that uh, the power law relation, although does not hold strictly uh, you know, heterogeneous cell population, but it actually gives us a, a lower bound. What do I mean by that? Uh, suppose you calculate some uh, RIG value uh, from PIG using this power law relation, and the value you get is actually the lower bound for, uh, of the true value. That means the true value of the pairwise distance is either equal or larger than the inferred value you calculated. And uh, this uh, uh, 
can be actually uh, demonstrated in a special case where there's only two uh, subpopulation where, um, uh, so that using the Jensen's equality, you can prove that uh, our, this parallel relation does have, uh, does is a, uh, is a lower bound. Um, so this suggests that without further knowledge of subpopulation compositions, it is reasonable to use this power law to infer uh, the distance matrix from the high C data. So then we would like to apply this to the high C data. The, the next question is that uh, what alpha value should we use? Uh, we, we know the alpha value for uh, ideal polymer or self volume polymer. However, for uh, 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 chromosomes, it is not known uh, theoretically. Fortunately, in, uh, in this experiment work, the author measured the pairwise distance and compared those to the high C measured contact probability. And they found that uh, the pairwise distance Rij and the contact probability Pij does have a power law dependence. And uh, the value of alpha is uh, about four. Uh, we also confirm uh, this value using a simulation study uh, using a, a copolymer chromosome model. So once we have this power law relation and the value of alpha, we can straightforwardly convert the high C contact map to uh, infer the mean distance map. And we believe this is a good starting point because it contains uh, the direct information about the distance between those sides. Uh, so the, when people think about the 3D structure, people usually uh, sometimes think of a, a unique uh, structure. This is true for majority of protein where there's a native structure exists. However, it has become, become more and more clear that uh, the chromosome conformation does not have a unique fold. Um, so that means that uh, if you look at the structure, uh, for for chromosome among different cells, single cell, you 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 will find that uh, they are all kind of different from each other. So our model should uh, uh, take this variation into the consideration as well. So the question is that can we get the ensemble of structure consistent with the experiment data? Uh, the starting point here is the our mean inferred uh, inferred mean distance matrix. Uh, calculated from the high C data, and we should uh, generate an ensemble of structure which uh, uh, which uh, reversely uh, can give back our inferred distance matrix, right? So, in principle, there are an infinite number of possible ensembles which can be consistent with our uh, target. Uh, here, we use the principle of maximum entropy to find the unique ensembles. So. Using the inferred mean distance matrix as our constraint, right? We can write down the corresponding maximum entropy distribution here, uh, where the left hand side is the joint probability of coordinates of individual loci, xi. Uh, and uh, it can be written in this exponential form, where the kij is the parameter we need to determine. And uh, the value of the kij can be determined from our constraint. Uh, using the classic iterative scaling method, we get, we update the value of Kij uh, at each each iteration uh, using this formula. Uh, uh, at, after a certain number of iteration, we can uh, converge to a, a very good result. So here, uh, this is the comparison between the inferred distance matrix uh, and uh, our model. So the lower triangle is the inferred distance map computed from the high C data. And the upper triangle is the result uh, from the model. Uh, this shows that the distance map of the reconstructed structure uh, agree pretty well with our uh, target. And uh, this is a chromosome one, two, three, four. Uh, as you can see that uh, all of them have a pretty good agreement. Um, so here, uh, I sh uh, this is the typical com uh, chromosome conformation for this particular cell type, uh, and uh, um, and as so this is the typical. I mean, the radius radius of generation of each uh, structure is the average value of that ensemble. However, uh, you can also look at the vari variation of the Rg. 
Uh, this is the distribution of the radius generation RG for chromosome 5 for this cell type. And as you can see that uh, some individual uh, chromosome conformation uh, has a much larger value of RG than the others. So that, uh, uh, this suggests that there's a large variation among individual conformations. Uh, to further demonstrate that, I, this is a movie where uh, the 1,000 individual chromosome uh, conformation are, are superimposed together, and the color encodes the genomic location along the genome, and you can see that uh, it captures the probabilistic nature of the uh, chromosome structures. Um, also, the reconstructed ensemble structure uh, captures the uh, segregation between uh, A-B compartments shown here. Uh, we can also overlay different uh, biological markers, such as the individual genes, uh, RNA-seq or chip -seq data, with our reconstructed structures. Here is the example where the ATEX signal is overlaid with the structure, um, and you can see that uh, uh, the loci with high uh, ataxic rate uh, segregate with the loci with low ataxic rate. And uh, this segregation pattern is roughly consistent with the segregation between A and B compartments, which is uh, kind of expected because people believe that the A compartments uh, is related to gene expression and it should, have a, it should be more accessible so that it has a high, uh, higher ATAC uh, signal. Then the next question we ask is that um, uh, we want to look at the structure of uh, uh, chromosome from different cell type. Uh, I showed before that this figure shows that uh, the conformation of a given chromosome is, uh, is highly heterogeneous, even in a single cell type, right? Uh, so the natural, natural question is that uh, if I give you a conformation for chromosome 5 from cell type 1, and uh, another conformation uh, from chromosome five, but from a different cell type. Can we actually distinguish them? Can you tell which, co which conformation is from which cell type? This is a non-trivial question because uh, we actually have a large variation uh, among a, a chromosome structure, even in a single cell type. Um, so, by, so here is a result um, where uh, I first generate ensemble of structure for each uh, cell type. Uh, uh, and uh, then I use the TSNI to project the structure on a two-dimensional space. And this is result for chromosome 21. Uh, and you can see that the so different color, uh, different, uh, each point represents an individual uh, chromosome conformation. And uh, uh, it shows that a uh, different color occupy uh, these uh, distinct territories. And uh, especially for this three cell type, the blue, red, and green, they form a distinct cluster and also well segregated from each other. Uh, so this suggests that the, although there's a, a large heterogeneity uh, among chromosome conformation in a single cell type, the difference in the heterogeneity of the uh, 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 same chromosome in different cell types can be nevertheless be quantitatively discerned. Uh, to conclude, uh, we use a polymer theory uh, and to show that the power law relation between contact probability and the dist pairwise distance is a good approximation. And uh, using the principle of the maximum entropy, uh, we can uh, generate an ensemble of chromosome structure consistent with the uh, mean pairwise distance. Uh, uh, in this work, uh, we are directly uh, uh, infer this mean pairwise distance from the HiC data. Uh, uh, however, if we have the direct measurement of this uh, pairwise distance such, uh, from an image experiment, we can apply our uh, method on that as well. Uh, we also show that the single cell uh, chromosome structure are very heterogeneous. Uh, and uh, instead of it, this heterogeneity, uh, the chromosome of different cell type can be uh, nevertheless distinguished to a large degree uh, in terms of their 3D structure uh, using uh, manifold learning techniques such as TSNI. Um, 
With that, I would like to thank my uh, advisor, Dr. Uh, uh, Dave Surumalai, and all the group members here. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for, for a very clear and uh, presentation. And she didn't even. Excuse me? And we're open uh, for uh, uh, questions. So please just go into the participants list and uh, raise your hand. All right, um, we can, well, they're popping in and out a lot. So Bill, you're very fast. <laughs> I'm fast? Yeah, you're the first one up there. Okay, That's ask because away. I'm, it's because I'm in Scotland and I'm so close. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so you say that the, it's, it's interesting that, uh, that the, the structures are extremely variable and that's what I would expect from nucleus to nucleus, but there's something in, in our high C data uh, with Job Decker and Leonid Mirny in, in our science paper that, that really uh, confuses me or a little bit. And that is that when we look at cells that are arrested at a very specific place in the cell cycle, the pattern we see in the high maps becomes, high C maps becomes incredibly sharp, even though this is being done on a population basis. Um, I just wonder if you have a, a comment on that. So we see the sort of maps that everybody's used to seeing for the sort of the plaid structure outside the diagonal and high C in, 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 in log phase cultures. But when we look at G2 cells, that, that map becomes really sharp as though, it, there, as though there is an element of reproducibility. Uh, so do you mean the checkerboard pattern? In the high yeah. C? yeah, yeah. So, I, uh, um, so the checkerboard patterns People believe it's uh, related to the, uh, the segregation between A and B compartments. So if I I would imagine if you see if you observe that uh, it become more clear or more prominent, that means that just uh, suggests that at least uh, in your in your average sense, the segregation uh, the macrophase separation between A and B compartments become more uh, more strong. It's the uh, but uh, I'm not. Um, I'm not yeah. sure. Do I follow the, the the question regarding the in in the in the context of variation? Uh, well, I, I'm not a polymer physicist, so it's a very it, it's a naive question. But I think your answer is probably right that the that those those the variation between the various compartments varies across the cell cycle. So when you look at a, at a, at a bulk population that's not synchronized, it's, it's a little bit more smeared than when you see a population at one state, in one place in the cell cycle. But it just struck me that that seems to suggest that there is some reproducibility, but perhaps not in the conformation of the polymer, but perhaps in more in the association of these regions. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, uh, suppose you have a perfect uh, synchronization between the uh, same cell type. Uh, I would imagine that like, you get this high, very high, uh, 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 like get the same result every time you do the experiment. But uh, nevertheless, the high C is the uh, the contact map is from many many cells, right? So yeah. uh, it's still a, a average value where, uh, in principle, it's hard to tell the variation just look by looking at high C. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, I, I think next was uh, Michela. You had your hand up. Yes. Um, okay, so thank you for the talk. It's very interesting and it sort of highlights uh, some points of contest between our research. I mean, we've been pushing for this idea of ensembles for a long time. Yeah. Um, so, and, and we have a paper. So, Ryan Chang is there, is the next that is going to ask you something. So Ryan has this paper in which we show that one way to look at the differences between the ensembles of different cell lines is looking at what kind of, if you look at the compartmentalization patterns, uh, you see that the microphases that are active, they tend to move toward the periphery of the nuclear territories. And that's one clear order parameters that's distinguishing different cell types. And, uh, and again, 
It's important to notice that in our case, we're not inverting the high seed data. We are using the epigenetic data to calculate these things. So we're making a, you know, a full prediction. And this, this ensembles, they, they correspond to the ensembles we observe in high seed and in fish and in, uh, uh, you know, DNA tracing and so on. But the point is, that I get to my question, is your T is near, your, your order parameter that you're plotting on a low dimensionality, low dimensionality reduction, can it be connected to anything similar to our order parameter that is moving active genes uh, uh, to uh, the periphery or what does that parameter mean? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So I didn't uh, look at that particular um, aspect where how the, how the, how the a particular region changes uh, whether move towards the center or periphery depend on the cell type. Because the T-SNE, uh, it's not, uh, uh, so usually it's not a one single collective variable. So um, I, we do look at some other collective variable which has physical intuition, uh, such as the, the degree of the se uh, segregation between A and B compartments in different cell types. We do see that also has some, some difference between cell types. But uh, uh, so just look at look look at uh, one of few collective variable. Um, uh, sometimes it's hard to actually tell a cell uh, cell type apart from each other. So the T oh. is like a, um, uh, um, it's a manifold where it's directly project a high dimensional object into a, onto a two dimensional. Yeah. No, I understand. And in fact, we have struggled for a long time to find an order parameter that could distinguish a yeah. cell type from another. Yeah. And it's not easy. I mean, and uh, we tried many, we failed many. And then we found that if you look at a compartment, a, at a region, at a gene that is switching from a compartment to another, so that it's changing its epigenomics, that, that gene is moving toward the nuclear periphery, not the nuclear periphery, toward the uh, chromosome periphery. Okay. And that's actually been observed uh, many times in, in experiments. So I was wondering if you can sort of confirm this finding with yeah, your, that, that, that inversion, that are not prediction, but that inversion. Yeah, that's very interesting. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's a very suggestion. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. So uh, Ryan, you had a question? Yes, I mean, uh, McKelly essentially uh, asked the key parts of what I was going to uh, ask, but um, I, I guess you know, is there in your last figure, which which was was very, I mean, your talk is very interesting. Uh, in your last figure, you basically do have, uh, according to your your uh, order parameter, differences between the structural ensembles of the different the chromosomes belong to different cell types. Yeah. I, I was wondering, you know, um, I mean, what 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 but, uh, what physical intuition do you have regarding those differences? I mean. Uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So um, in order to have some physical intuition, you need to have define some collect variable like you did, right? Um, which has a direct intuition. So we did we do calculate the two particular collect variable. First is the degree of the segregation between AB compartments. Uh, and the other is the, uh, we call it the degree of the, uh, the, the degree of how, how, the, how the structure is uh, a fractal. Like uh, because of um, the, the concept of fractal globule is that uh, the loci uh, uh, close along the uh, genome, uh, uh, genome uh, may also be uh, proximity in 3D space. And we define some collective variable based on that concept. And we do find that the different cell type also have a different distribution of that collective variable. Uh, but like I said, if you just look at one, because the distribution is pretty wide, so when they overlap on each other, just by looking at the distribution, uh, if, I give, if, get, if I give you the, the overlap or uh, superposition of all the distribution together, you cannot tell them apart. Uh, the, the, um, Have yeah. you been able to corroborate any of this with um, like any, um, for example, RNA-seq data or any data regarding um, transcriptional activity or uh, anything like that? Yeah, I, I haven't done that. Yeah, so, so, so far we only look at the T, uh, A taxi. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I think there are no further questions. So let's thank uh, you one more time, Guan.
Thank you. And uh, we'll move on now to our next and final speaker in the morning session. Um, I think I was told she has joined us, and that's going to be Gita Nar Lakar uh, from UCSF, and she can will be speaking on can phase separation explain heterochromatin properties. Thank the organizers for inviting me to this virtual workshop. And then I'm excited to share our recent work on heterochromatin and phase separation. As many of us know, heterochromatin is a classic context to study genome compartmentalization. And shown here is one of the many ways in which heterochromatin is, is described, which is cytologically. If you take a mammalian cell and stain it for DNA, you see darkly stained regions that we term heterochromatin and lightly stained regions that we term euchromatin. Now, um, a highly conserved type of heterochromatin is mediated by the protein HP1. This, uh, at the heart of this type of heterochromatin is a complex form between the HP1 protein and chromatin that is methylated on histone H3 lysine 9. This type of heterochromatin serves many different functions. It represses transcription, it plays a role in repressing recombination, it is really critical for proper chromosome segregation, and it is really critical for conferring rigidity to the whole nucleus. And so the complex form between HP1 and, and chromatin uh, plays diverse biological roles. And one of our longstanding questions in the lab is how does HP1 mediated heterochromatin serve so many different types of roles in biology? Now, in addition to the, the many different roles that um, this type of heterochromatin plays, there is also a longstanding apparent paradox in, in, in the field, which is uh, uh, sh captured by these two images. So on the one hand, if you look at heterochromatin domains shown by this darkly stained region, they seem to be stable in space over several hours and often over the lifetime of a cell. On the other hand, if you look at these study, older studies by Mistelli and Kiosis labs, what they found was if you can fluorescently label HP1 alpha and frap it in, within these bodies, HP1 molecules recover on the order of seconds. So somehow, the molecules that maintain these stable domains are highly dynamic and come on and off on the order of seconds. And so another longstanding question in the field has been, how are these stable compartments maintained despite the participant molecules coming on and off on the order of seconds. And to address these and other related questions, uh, we have been interested in understanding the biophysical mechanisms that underlie the functions and properties of HP1 mediated heterochromatin. Now, before I describe uh, what we've learned in the last several years, let me give you a proper introduction to the HP1 molecule. Um, this molecule has uh, two structured domains, a chroma domain that binds the histone mark, a chroma shadow domain that forms a dimer and a dimerization interface that binds hydrophobic motifs. Uh, it also has three unstructured regions, uh, N-terminal extension, a C-terminal extension, and a hinge that has positively charged residues, mainly lysines, that bind both DNA and RNA. Now, this dimeric architecture and this overall domain architecture of H1 molecules is highly conserved. It's conserved all the way from Palm B fission east to humans. In Palm B, the main H1 protein is called SOI6. In humans, one of the main H1 proteins is H1 alpha. So using the Palm B uh, protein SOI6, we learned several years ago that this protein can oligomerize across chromatin, and oligomerization is enabled by a specific architecture of this molecule on chromatin, where four molecules of SOI6 bind to a single nucleosome creating sticky ends that form oligomerization interfaces. A little more recently, we found that the human HP1 molecule, HP1 alpha, can form phase-separated droplets. But in, in the process of forming these phase-separated droplets, it starts out from an auto-inhibited state in the absence of any ligands. When you add in DNA, it binds the DNA and then forms these uh, phase-separated droplets. We believe uh, binding of DNA opens up the auto-inhibited state because the hinge region, which is occluded in the auto-inhibited state, now becomes accessible due to DNA binding. And this allows the HP1 alpha molecule to oligomerize and form the many multivalent interactions that are needed for phase-separated droplets. I want to point out that this phase separation behavior is seen in the absence of crowding agents and under physiologically relevant HP1 alpha concentrations in the low micromolar reg uh, regime. We also learned in our earlier studies, in collaboration with Cy Redding's lab, 
that HPN molecules can dramatically compact DNA. Shown here is a, a DNA curtains assay a pioneered by Cy Redding's lab to look at HP1 molecules. What you see here are individual strands of lambda DNA attached at one end on a glass slide and stretched out by flow, by buffer flow. And what you're going to see next is what happens to these lightly fluorescently labeled uh, DNA molecules when we add in HP1 molecules. Okay. This is what, what happens. In real time, these HP1 molecules are dramatically condensing the DNA on the order of seconds. Okay. So what I've shown you so far is that HP1 molecules can oligomerize across chromatin, they can dramatically compact the DNA, and they can form phase-separated droplets. So combining these three features of biophysical features of HP1 molecules, we, we have a very simplistic working model for how HP1 molecules might enable the formation of structures in a cell. So in this model, multiple HP1 molecules oligomerize on chromatin, and when they oligomerize on chromatin, the local concentration of HPM molecule goes up and dra dra can drive them into adopting a phase-separated state. Now, this phase-separated state uh, can then compartmentalize the chromatin and, per, and also shield the chromatin for, from things like RNA polymerase. Now, this is an um, attractive model because it is simple and intuitive, and it provides a, an explanation for how phase separation can uh, participate in genome compartmentalization. I also want to mention that our discovery of phase separation of H1 molecules happened in parallel with, with similar findings from the Carpin lab. Okay, so while this is intuitive and exciting, it is still somewhat superficial. And so in the past several years, what we've tried to do is to dig deep into the biophysical basis underlying phase separation by HP and alpha uh, with the goal of trying to understand what are the properties that phase separation can confer on heterochromatin. And can we learn something about how, from these properties about how heterochromatin might actually function in, in the cell? Okay. So what I'm going to share with you next for the rest of the talk are some of these in-depth biophysical studies. And these were carried out by uh, Madeline Keenan, a talented and brave graduate student um, uh, who is a joint graduate student between my lab and the lab of my colleague, Sai Redding. So everything I'm going to tell you for the rest of the talk is a close and complete collaboration with the Reading Lab and has been led um, uh, very courageously by Madeline Keenan. So what Madeline wanted to ask was, what are the types of mesoscale properties that are enabled by phase separation of HP1? And, and to do this, she decided she would keep the system simple. She would only focus on how HP1 alpha interacts with DNA. Because our goal was to understand what are the intrinsic properties of the system so we could then build in complexity, such as adding chromatin. So for full disclosure, the rest of the talk does not have any chromatin in it. All I'm going to show you are interact, uh, what HP1 alpha interacting with DNA can give you. And as you will hopefully see, even in the simple two-component system, we are uncovering unexpected properties of HP1 DNA phases. And underlying a lot of Madeline's questions was this basic biological question, which is, how does dynamic HP1 binding result in stable and regulatable genome organization? So before, um, before I get into um, some of Madeline's data, I just want to take a step back and ask, what do we mean by phase separation? Because we talk about this quite a bit in, in, in the field, in the literature. And when we try to describe phase separation, to perhaps somebody who's not in the field or perhaps who's not a scientist, the example that often comes to mind is oil and water. Okay? And um, it, it's, a, it's a fair example, uh, and it's a, because it's an intuitive, intuitive and easy to explain example. So what happens in, in, when you have oil and water? Uh, oil molecules shown in yellow are very weakly solvated by water. They would rather interact with each other to form these oil droplets than interact with water. And these kinds of droplets are, are, um, have a, a few very defined features. Uh, droplets retain the oil molecules. The oil molecules don't come in and out that rapidly. And there's very little water in the oil molecules because, again, oil is hydrophobic and water is not going to be solvated by the oil. Okay. So this is one type of phase separation that um, we can discuss. But physicists and, and, and chemists over the last decades, many decades, have found that you, phase separation comes in many, many types. Okay? And uh, it, you can have other types of phase separation that involve electrostatic interactions. And, and to give an example that is slightly diff quite different than oil and water, 
uh, I'd like to take the example of phase separation mediated by interactions between oppositely charged polyanions and, and cations. So what you have here is a system where you have polyanions uh, and polycations at a certain concentration in, in solution. And as you increase the concentration of these polyions above a certain critical concentration, they would rather interact with each other than with solvent and they can form phase separated states. Now these phase separated states are quite different than the oil and water phase separated states because polyions can diffuse in and out because they can, they can also be solvated by, by water. And the droplets that are, the phase separated droplets formed by the interaction between the polyions can contain water. And so if we look at these two types of phase separated systems and ask what does HP1 and DNA resemble more, uh, we believe it resembles more this, the, this latter type of phase separation system mediated by electrostatic interactions. Because um, phase separation in HP1, in the HP1 context, is mediated by the interaction of DNA, uh, negatively charged DNA, with the positively charged hinge. Now, in addition to being electrostatic, um, compared to other phase separation systems that rely on electrostatic interactions in biology, uh, interactions between HP1 and DNA have another feature that is quite different from other biological systems, which is the length of DNA. HP1 molecules have to organize kilobases to megabase level uh, regions of DNA. And when you get to that level of uh, DNA length, you now have to start thinking about the polymer behavior of DNA participating in the types of phases that are generated. So uh, Madeline set out to, to ask, does, HP, does the HP1 DNA phase separation system resemble this kind of uh, electrostatically driven phase separated system? And do the HP1 molecules diffuse readily in and out of these phases? And to do that, she used, uh, made a phase separated droplets using a fluorescently labeled H1 molecules. So green H1 molecules, unlabeled DNA, she formed green droplets, and then she frapped the whole droplet and asked, how readily does this recover? And what I'm showing you next is the movie of this, of this frap experiment. See the droplet is frapped, and this is real time. Within seconds, um, H1 molecules have recovered. Okay. Now what is interesting about this exp simple experiment is that you can see that there's a very small barrier to the entry and exit of H1 alpha molecules, yet the droplet maintains it in its integrity and shape. So this and other experiments I don't have time to show you, um, suggests that HP1 DNA, the HP1 DNA phase separation system more resembles the system I've shown on the right here uh, that is driven by electrostatics, and less so the system by, of oil and water where you have sharp boundaries and a real, uh, a, a real containment of the, the HP1 molecules. Okay, so having, having seen this in the context of um, HP1 and DNA, Madeline uh, next went on to ask, can she get to the core of the question that she set out to ask, which is how does dynamic H1 binding result in stable and regulatable genome organization? Okay. And for this, she chose these phase separated droplets that I've been describing as simple models for HP1 DNA territories because these droplets can contain DNA and we can study their intrinsic properties and, and very, very loosely model them as HP1 DNA territories. Okay. So you know, one of the first questions she asked was, um, what happens when two territories mix? Does the HP1, molecule, HP1 content mix between these territories and does the DNA content mix within these territories? So the first thing she asked was what happens uh, to the HP1 content? And to do this experiment, she made two types of droplets. Um, green droplets with fluorescently labeled, green fluorescently labeled H1 alpha molecules and red droplets with red fluorescently labeled H1 alpha molecules. And in both of these droplets, the DNA was a long piece of DNA now, a 3 kb piece of DNA, and it was unlabeled. Okay. So these droplets require the, form, the presence of DNA. She formed green droplets, red droplets, mixed them for uh, about one and a half hours and waited and asked, what happens to, to the, do the droplets fuse? And if they fuse, do they exchange contents? If they exchange contents, we, we expect the droplets to become yellow because uh, both the, uh, all droplets would have green and, and red HP1 alpha molecules. And that's what she says. Uh, this is what, how the droplets look after mixing and waiting for one and a half hours. All the droplets show uh, red, all the droplets show green, and all the droplets show yellow. Okay. And you can see even these two droplets that have just fused, 
in the act of fusing have already become yellow. So we, uh, what, this, what this result said was that H1 molecules uh, exchange pretty rapidly between droplets when the droplets fuse. Okay? And that was not a surprise given the FRAP data that I just showed you. But the real experiment came when Madeline asked what happens to the DNA. And so for this, she, she, re, um, she did a parallel type of experiment where now she used unlabeled HPN alpha molecules, but labeled DNA molecules. So you had green droplets with, uh, made with green fluorescently labeled DNA, red droplets made with uh, red fluorescently labeled DNA, formed the droplets, then mixed the two droplets and waited for one and a half hours and asked, does the DNA between these two droplets, when they fuse, does the DNA mix? Okay. So again, we're looking at the, the, the DNA because the DNA is labeled, the HP1 is unlabeled. And this is what she sees. Okay. Um, this is after waiting for one and a half hours. She sees that most droplets are either red or green, and even all the droplets that fuse, the DNA remains in its territories largely. And this is again on the order of, of, of several minutes and up to a, an, an hour and a half. Okay. So what she sees is that, for example, you can look here, this droplet has been formed by the fusion of a, re a red droplet and a green droplet. Okay. We know from the previous experiment that H1 molecules have rapidly exchanged, yet the DNA remains in its territory. The red DNA remains in one territory and the green DNA remains in the other. There's a very low amount of mixing here, but nothing compared to the yellow that I showed you in the previous experiment. So DNA exchange much more slowly between droplets than HP and alpha. And you can see this in, in, in a different kind of movie where now you have pink DNA and green DNA, and you can see these droplets mixing, bumping into each other, fusing, and yet the DNA remains in its territories. And this goes on for the order of half an hour to an hour. Okay, um, so how do we explain this? Okay. How do we explain the phenomena that we are seeing that h one molecules are clearly coming on and off on the order of seconds, yet the DNA is remaining in its territories on the order of hours? Okay. So here's where we could go back to uh, many of our findings from previous years, and we, we could use those to build a model. So we know that h one molecules can oligomerize. We know that they can bridge across different parts of chromatin and different parts of DNA. And we know that h one molecules, as shown by the curtains assay, DNA curtains assay, can dramatically compact the DNA. Okay. And so we have now a, a working model where h, h one molecules, even though they're weakly bound, because they can oligomerize, they can cross bridge across DNA and form multiple interactions that hold and the DNA in place and allow folding of the DNA into a small and compact territory. Now, uh, I mentioned DNA polymer effects earlier. The longer you make the DNA, the more viscous uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the solution is going to behave. And so we believe that as the DNA is getting longer, the viscosity of the solution is increasing. But HP1 molecules further cross-bridging the DNA and, and keeping it in a small territory further increases the effective viscosity of the system and keeps the DNA kinetically trapped in a small region. So to think about this, you can imagine any individual h molecule coming on and off on the order of seconds and exploring its surroundings and exchanging with the surroundings. But at any time, there will always be multiple h molecules holding the DNA down and uh, trapping it in a network of h um, uh, molecules so that the whole entire DNA molecule can very uh, where cannot readily sample uh, a solution space around it. Okay? And so just to summarize, we think that weakly bound h and alpha oligomers bridge different regions of DNA, further increasing their effective viscosity and keeping them kinetically trapped in their own phase-separated territories. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm suggesting here now in this model is that h molecules are not just behaving like the poly ions I described in the beginning. They're not just neutralizing the charge of the DNA, but they're doing something more. They're cross-bridging and adding in additional interaction energy to hold the DNA down. If that's the case, we, we thought this might be reflected in the stability of the system. And to get a sense of the mechanical stability of the system, uh, what Madeline decided to do was to do a force-pulling experiment. And to do this experiment, she collaborated with Lucy Brennan, a postdoc, joint postdoc in the labs of Cy Redding and Basim Al-Sadi at UCSF. 
And um, she also got a lot of uh, useful um, help with some controls from Roman Renger and Stefan Grill's lab. So here's the experiment. What, what Madeline and Lucy did was they took a long piece of Lambda DNA, they tethered either end to um, a, a bead that could be held in a laser in an optical trap. So both ends of this long piece of Lambda DNA are now tethered. They took this long piece of DNA, dipped it into a solution of HPN alpha, and that was fluorescently labeled, shown here in, in pink. And that results in the formation of a small condensate or a phase in the middle of the DNA because there's more slack in the middle of the DNA. So uh, it's easier to bend and fold the DNA in the middle of, uh, in the middle of the strand. And now what they're going to do is they're going to ask, what happens when we pull this polystyrene bead in the optical trap? How much force do we need to dissolve this droplet? Okay. And this is what they see. And what I'm showing you is the first few pulls of 10 successive uh, uh, pulling experiments. They're pulling, they're pulling. It's not coming apart. It's not dissolving. And what is nice about this setup is that it's highly quantifiable. I won't go through all the 10 successive pulls, but I'll show you the quantification. You can quantify the extension of DNA as a, as a function of the force applied. If there is no HP1 alpha droplet on the DNA, you see the black force extension curve. The DNA is extended, and uh, above 40 piconewtons, it starts uh, unpairing. Okay, so they could not go above 40 piconewtons. But what you see here is what happens to uh, the system when you now have part of the DNA trapped in this HP1 phase. As you pull, you pull, the, the droplet does, you still have a large amount of DNA trapped inside the droplet, even at 40 piconewtons force. The droplet does not fall apart. And with each successive pull, as shown in this direction, going left, uh, right to left, it gets harder and harder to pull, uh, to pull the DNA. It's almost as though something is getting, getting tightened inside uh, the, the, the more often you pull. Okay? So this is a really high amount of force. But how, how can we contextualize it? Even at 40 piconewtons, this droplet is not falling apart. Even though, remember, h one molecules are coming on and off on the order of seconds. Okay? And to put it in context, um, uh, RNA polymerase stalls at 20 piconewtons. Okay? And yet, these little structures that we've shown here with just h one alpha and DNA are stable up to 40 piconewtons. Okay? So what these studies were, uh, are now beginning to suggest to us is that what HP1 alpha DNA phases give us are mechanical structures that are, can form a barrier to polymerases, a mechanical barrier to polymerases. They can begin to explain how heterochromatin confers mechanical rigidity to the nucleus, and they can begin to explain how these kinds of phases might confer structural stability at kinetochores. Okay. So what I've shown you so far is that these, stable, uh, the, these uh, domains and territories are stable, in term, at least viewed from the perspective of DNA. They don't come apart. But in biology and development, you do have to break apart HP1 heterochromatin when you have to turn on a gene or during replication. So if these condensates are so stable to mechanical force, how might they be regulated? And so I'm going to end with one last experiment uh, where Madeline asked, can HP1 paralogs be part of the answer? Okay, so, so far, I've been talking about HP1 alpha, but now I'm going to introduce HP1 beta. HP1 beta yeah, is, has similar sequence, uh, is largely similar to HP1 alpha in sequence, but has a few small sequence differences because of which HP1 beta does not form droplets with DNA and does not compact DNA. Okay? So what Madeline asked was, could HP1 beta, shown in green, act as a poison for HP1 alpha? So here's what she did. She made droplets with uh, green HP1 alpha, fluorescently labeled a DNA, shown here. Sorry, not green, but, but orange, orange droplets. She then added in green HP1 beta and asked what happens to these HP1 alpha DNA droplets. Okay. And so this is um, what you'll see. You can see that HP1 alpha droplets are dissolving. But before they dissolve, HP1 beta, shown by the green channel, gets, in, channel gets into the droplets. Okay? So HP1 beta is able to dissolve HP1 alpha droplets by transiently entering the droplets. We believe it does show so by forming heterodimers that uh, interfere with, with uh, HP1 alpha's ability to interact with DNA. Okay. So to summarize uh, what I've shown you so far, um, 
we think all of these biophysical properties of HP and alpha DNA condensates that we are discovering can confer biologically useful behaviors. Okay, and what are these behaviors? They can give you DNA compartments that inhibit mixing of DNA but allow mixing of HP1. This could uh, this occlusion of DNA may enable repression of transcription recombination. This, these kinds of phases can give you compacted DNA that is highly resistant to biologically relevant forces and can ex begin to explain how mechanical rigidity is confirmed to the nuclear periphery and at the, uh, and periphery and at the centromere. And finally, because HP, the, these structures are formed by dynamic on and off uh, HP1 interactions, these structures are also able to be rapidly dissolved on the same time scale by other molecules such as HP1 alpha par paralogs that can compete with HP1, uh, with HP1 alpha. And so you can have both stability and rapid regulatability uh, be because of the intrinsic biophysical features of these phase phases. Okay? And so what I'd like to suggest is that what I've shown you so far is a, a starting point to conceptualize mechanisms of genome compartmentalization by other genome packaging proteins. I've shown you what happens with H1 alpha and DNA, but I would predict that there are other molecules that organize DNA that share some of the same properties and might begin to explain how genome compartmentalization is enabled and what role phase separation might play in this process. Now, I want to just end by coming back to uh, uh, phase separation being of diverse types. You can have oil and water type of phase separation. You can have the type of phase separation I, I just described with H1 alpha molecules. Uh, what I would suggest um, uh, is that there are many, many more different types of phase separation in biology waiting to be discovered. So, so, uh, so what, what we need to do is to characterize these phases before we rush to define them. And with that, I'd like to thank you for participating in this virtual seminar. I want to first and foremost thank Madeline Keenan for spearheading this work and leading us into new and uncharted conceptual and technical territory. Um, I want to thank um, uh, Serena Saluli for the work she did in the context of chromatin that I did not have time to talk about. I want to give a big shout out to Cy Redding. Uh, he's been a wonderful collaborator and, and has really taught me a lot about the physics underlying phase separation. Um, and finally, uh, a shout out to Adam Larson, who got us into the field of phase separation in the first place by discovering um, the, um, that HPN molecules can phase separate. And um, my, the, my remaining wonderful collaborations and uh, my funding. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. That was a very stimulating talk. Um, I'm sure there'll be many questions. Oh, yes. So uh, didn't quite catch who came first, but I think it's Guan Chi. We'll start with you, then Margaret, and then Clifford. Hi, good. Uh, thanks for the great talk. So I'm wondering, like, uh, if I look at the, the, the force extension curve, it seems at uh, each pooling you have a different curve. Uh, do you know uh, what's the reason for that? Is, is it because that each uh, each pooling, uh, the, the size of the DNA cluster in the middle is different or some other reason? Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so le le let me uh, first clarify. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so what I showed you on the quantification is the same piece of DNA being pulled successively. Okay. And so what we see, and we don't fully understand why we see this, so we're still trying to figure it out. But when, after the first pull, when you pull the second time, the same exact condensate, it doesn't go as far. I see. And so something about applying mechanical force seems to also change the nature of the condensate and it's, it's cumulative. And so um, I can speculate widely as to what might be happening, but we don't really understand it. It's kind of interesting and we need to do some more work. Thank you. Hey, uh, Margaret, you're next. Hi, thanks. That was really nice. I had a question about that last result when you have you flow in this HP1 beta, does it the number two or beta version, does it bind to the DNA? It's a great question. Um, as far as we can detect, its affinity for the DNA seems to be at least two orders of magnitude weaker. Okay. But we think we can detect really low binding when you increase the length of the DNA. 
So it's possible it's competing in part by binding to the DNA uh, and in part by actually uh, forming heterodimers. But its affinity uh, for DNA is much, much weaker than uh, HPN alphas. Okay, uh, Clifford? Hi, Gita, nice talk. Um, I was gonna ask the same question as the first one. And so it's interesting uh, that you uh, see this kind of hysteresis or, or you know, dependence as you go, which I guess suggests that it's not really in an equilibrium. Um, and so, yeah, I do think that's fascinating. And so uh, you already gave an answer to that. So I, I guess while I'm speaking, I'll just say, I liked what you said about um, this, you know, there seems like there's been a rush to define different types of phase separation. And to me, it's all very, it's all hand waving, like no one's done any measurements. And so that's a, just an editorial comment uh, uh, supporting your comment, thanks. Thank, thank you, Cliff, yes, I, I, I think it's, um, for the, since this is an NSF, uh, a bunch of biophysicists here, uh, as well, uh, the comparison that I, I am drawing uh, is to the early days of the protein folding field, when um, there were all kinds of models going about, okay, is it hydrophobic collapse, is it this, is it that, and there was a little bit of a rush to define, this is how it is, right? And just to kind of uh, resonate with you, Cliff, um, I think biology keeps surprising us, so we should just wait and study it better. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's again, my, my, my feeling. Very good, yeah, thank you. Okay, so Dave, what do you have to say to that? <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, first of all, it's a fantastic talk. Uh, with, uh, lots of um, <clears throat> results that one could in principle quantify as opposed to if you thought long and hard. I have a couple of questions. When you labeled um, the HP1 alpha, and did the mixing experiment. It looked like after an hour and a half, the, the shapes of the droplets are more dumbbell-like. Whereas when you did the DNA labeling, they were more spherical after nearly the same time. Do you know why this is so? Yeah, so I should, I should clarify <clears throat> that that was just the field of view that we chose. Oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's um, and what's coming, and this is, we are writing the story up, is a much more rigorous quantification where we look at the droplet sizes. So yes, that, that, that were, I wouldn't read too much into- yeah. the, So it's the, all spherical, pick, is, is it all eventually, spherical? They eventually become spherical, but what I did not have time to share was that, and, and this may be intuitive to some folks in this audience, if you make the DNA even longer, if you go to 8 KB or 50 KB, what I showed you was the fusion of droplets with 3 KB DNA, then the shapes change. They don't, they're no longer spherical. That's because the, the, the viscosity of the DNA is fighting against the surface tension uh, behavior dictated by HP1. You start seeing these irregular shapes. And there, if you mix two types of droplets, they take even longer to mix their DNA, but HP1 still mixes. So, yes. which is why we think that the polymer properties of DNA really play a role. And so, as you make it longer, they no longer become spherical. So, I think perhaps that's what you might have been uh, thinking about as well. The, the second question I have is, you repeatedly said that the HP1 alpha exchanges on a second time scale. Um, but when you're in the droplet, and this may in fact go back to the pulling experiments at the end, um, how do you know that the HP1 alpha, which in fact are condensing the DNA, are not there permanently. And it, the ones that are exchanging are just floating around around that. And so that's fast time scale. And the other one is in fact trapped in this gel-like state maybe. That's, an, that's a great question, Dave. Uh, and so uh, we are, I can tell you the first level answer and then I can tell you what you're doing to uh, solidify um, or test it further. Uh, the FRAP experiment I showed in the beginning, where we FRAP the whole droplet, we are quantifying those experiments carefully to see do, what percent recovery do we get? Because that will give yeah. us a sense of what fraction of HP1 is uh, bound that exchanges rapidly or not. And so far, again, th this is our initial, at least 95% recovers quickly, but we'll have to wait till we quantify it. And Yes, I completely agree with uh, 
the direction you're taking the question. We need to, we need a few more pieces of data. Thanks. Okay, um, Bill? You still have your question? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, uh, and really nice talk, yeah. I wonder, would it be interesting to look at the, what's going on with the DNA and the droplets, maybe using FRET to look at how the DNA is compacted? Could you do that? Um, yeah, that, 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 that is, that is a great idea. And that's something Madeline has toyed with and potentially, uh, if we could label, so there's a few different ways you can imagine doing this. And I'm, I suspect you're imagining in, in, along similar lines. If you have a really long piece yeah. of DNA, you can put labels across and, and, and try to, um, or if you take two different pieces of DNA, short pieces of DNA, put different probes on them. Mm -hmm. And so we haven't yet done it. Uh, we, it would be a little bit like, and there might be others in this audience who are better qualified to talk about this, but you can actually get distance constraints. I don't know how to imagine this in the context of live, you know, uh, beyond saying that you fr get fret versus don't get fret, could we get a, uh, a dynamic three-dimensional picture? That, that would be great. I, I, yeah, I mean, the question is, yeah. with, are the DNA molecules flexing in there or yeah, are they yeah. sort of frozen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and that, would be, that would be a great thing to figure out, especially the time scales of the flexing, right? Yeah. Because- And, I, and a second question, and that is if, the, if, these dro if these droplets are being driven by electrostatic interactions, can you, can you phase separate DNA with spermine? And is it similar? Is it similar to HP one? Okay. Okay. I did not include this slide. I have included the slide in other um, other talks, which are longer. So, uh, folks, uh, Steve Block and colleagues, and I think Steve Block, Michelle Wong, and others, they did a study. I'm going to get the year wrong, but let's just say several years ago, uh, where they looked at counter ion condensation of DNA, which would be something like spermine and spermidine. So you just take a polycation, mix it with DNA and you can see uh, phases, right? And they did a pulling experiment. And, wow. and, 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 and there's a number, right? Can you guess how much force it takes to break that? <laughs> Take a guess. 40, 40 piconewtons. piconewtons. <laughs> no, I don't know. Five piconewtons. Five, five piconewtons. Yeah. So that's spermine and spermidine. Again, it's, it's not a fair comparison, right? It's, the game is stacked against spermine and spermidine. They cannot cross-link. They don't have all the domains that HP1 has, right? But that yeah, gives us a benchmark, right? It gives us a benchmark for what a sim even simpler system would do and what the stability of that would be. Yeah, so that's quite stable. I mean, it's only three, it's only three charges on spermine, right? I think. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to get this wrong. Spermine and spermidine, there's a difference. Uh, but yeah, but, but, I think spermine is three and spermidine is two. Spermine is more, but I'm not sure which. Okay, there's a comment in here. Uh, three and four. Uh, one of them is three, the other one is four. Yeah. And I feel okay, is spermine has more. I think. Yeah, so somebody's just talking about spermine and I'm sorry, I can't, I can't multitask by looking at the chat. I'll just look at the people I see. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but, but one it's, one it's, more a, question? it's an order of magnitude difference. That's Okay, we have another question from Jose Onacek. Okay, this was a very, very nice talk. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. I like your analogy to phase transition, although I think it's always a dangerous game to do those analogies and try to figure out which one is closer, but I, I like it. But I have two questions on that regard. The first one is when you go to the real chromosomes, they are much longer than the piece of DNA you're looking at. So you're not reaching equilibrium. And uh, so I don't know how much the analogy is going to hold or if can you think about different domains doing separately, even so they are connected. The second one is you address in the beginning of your talk, you show the DNA is the histones and the histones are, tend to be positively charged. In the rest of your talk, you show the snake DNA. So what happens when you talk about heterochromatin who have the histone, the positive charge, how your analogy to polyelectrolytes survive? Um, great, both great questions, and we are working on both of them. So I don't have, you know, uh, sophisticated answers, but I can give you uh, what we know so far. So for the first part, in terms of chromatin, you're absolutely, of course, right. Uh, chromosomes, and it's going to be even longer. And, and so we can uh, begin estimating, even by just increasing the DNA length, we're already seeing uh, shapes change, right, and viscosity effects take over. We're working on adding chromatin. 
so stay tuned. Uh, the harder set of experiments, but we're doing similar experiments with chromatin now. Um, so you're right that the chromatin is going to be kinetically trapped. It's not going to be at equilibrium, but I think that is the fun part here. Right? Yeah. I think that is what biology is taking advantage of, that the, the non-equilibrium nature of the chromatin folding allows molecules like HP1 to take advantage of the intrinsic viscosity to keep things trapped. But how about right. the electrostatics when you put the histones? Yeah, so let's come to that. That was your second part, second question. So let's come to the second question. So what I also didn't tell you because of time is that um, when you start looking at how HP1 molecules interact with chromatin, a lot of these other domains, the folded domains, come into play. Okay. Um, and um, we think uh, many of the folded domains, like the chroma shadow domain that forms a dimer, actually makes pretty extensive contacts with the histone octamer. And some of those contacts are going to change the nature of the electrostatics on the polymer. So it's almost like you're coating, you're coating the polymer. And if you think uh, simplistically, you start with DNA and hinge interactions, and then add on interactions that now also deal with the histone octamer, then it's still on the electrostatic level, but you now start, you do start introducing hydrophobic effects um, because of another reason that I didn't have time to talk about the, uh, that work is published. What we found using the palm BHP on proteins, and this is what, what, what when, when, why I, when, we, when Cliff and I were talking, I wanted to say, let's just wait till we learn more before we start defining it. Turns out the palm BHP on protein uh, deforms the histone core, okay? It opens up the core residues in the histone, in, in the histone octomer, and exposes hydrophobics. So now, imagine, right? Now you don't just have electrostatic interactions driving it, but you've introduced new binding partners from hydrophobic residues that are normally buried, and now you're going to have different types of multivalent interactions. So it's not going to be simple electrostatics, and we see that because uh, the salt dependence does not match what you'd expect. It's kind of a complex mixture. So again, we are trying to figure this out by going deep into it, but all the questions you raised are, you know, very relevant. Thank you, fascinating. Okay. okay, I think we should thank all the speakers from this morning. I, uh, it's been a great session. Um, we'll have a final discussion uh, in a few minutes. I do wanna point out that there was some trouble with the YouTube feed uh, before the break. The talks were recorded, but they might be appearing um, somewhat later onto the YouTube feed. But otherwise, this has been a fantastic session. Thank you all again. And now I should turn it over to the organizers to lead the, uh, the final discussion. Hi. So, I yeah. think um, several things. First, I should say that um, thank you all, the speakers throughout the sessions. And uh, what we have planned for this uh, last session is uh, the four organizers, Harvey Levine, Phil Sharp, uh, Rick Young will be joined by, and myself will be joined by Krastan Blagoyev from the National Science Foundation. And we do not intend uh, this discussion to be a series of quantifications from us, but rather to really have this as a free flowing discussion, which we will see by each one of us saying a couple of sentences about the meeting and the future, and then it will just be a free-flowing discussion. So let me uh, start, since I'm already talking, and say that uh, I thought that there were many, all the talks were great, but some that stood out in my mind just randomly right now is Mike Rosen's talk in the beginning, um, there are many other lovely talks, such as Alexandra Zudovska's talk and uh, Dave Termalai's talk. And, uh, and, and I thought the talks, all the talks in the RNA session were just great. And uh, also uh, many talks from the Rice Group. And finally, I'd like to talk about Gita's talk because this was a perfect, perfect meeting, a uh, talk to end this meeting with. I mean, it was a spectacular talk in my view on every level. And because of things that I'm thinking about, and I also think people will agree that this is the future, what her talk encapsulated was the importance of underlying free energy landscapes that promote phase separation that rely on electrostatics, or are at least partially dependent on it, and that they occur on the polymeric background, 
And all of these processes are driven far from equilibrium. And I think that's, in my view, is where, as a somewhat new person in this field, feel that's the direction that will define and help understand the real processes. So with that, I will stop. I probably will have almost nothing to say other than to help moderate the session in case, in case somebody acts unruly. So that's my job from here on. So uh, Phil, I saw that you were on. Would you like to say some things just to see the discussions? Uh, I uh, thought the symposium was excellent. And I thank all the speakers and the participants. It came together pretty quickly. And uh, I have been impressed by uh, the range of topics and the speakers who've uh, been engaged. Uh, I also uh, particularly liked the last uh, presentation by Gita um, and thought it raised a lot of questions, even though it is a pretty defined system, as she points out. And we will have to uh, begin to explore the diversity even among HP1 proteins and the nature of the condensates they will form. I was interested in the question of would an RNA generated in the midst of that condensate with electrostatic principles as its major or contributing part of it, would an RNA actually move from one of those domains of a chromosome to another? Because I, I think then we may see some uh, interesting uh, properties of that condensate in terms of its, its engagement with RNA. Um, I uh, uh, chaired the session on RNA, which uh, really uh, also raised in excess is silencing a number of questions about how RNA uh, organizes uh, proteins that uh, are involved in silencing various regions of the chromosome. And I think the uh, integration of uh, the uh, properties of proteins with DNA and, and RNA is going to be a, a field rich with complexity, <laughs> rich with specificity, but uh, and also rich with implications for how we can approach biological problems and even interpret phenomena that we, we at present uh, can't. So uh, a very rich topic, a whole, a very rich field uh, undergoing a transformation uh, that will be, as I said at the beginning in the brief comments, that are, is introducing the element of dynamics into cell biology in ways we've not been able to, to do before and integrating uh, physics with a cell and molecular biology in ways that the cell biologist side is infrequently uh, been able to do. So uh, a very exciting symposium. Maybe we'll go to Herbie next. Thanks. So um, this is very interesting symposium, partially because I'm an outsider to this field. I actually don't work on chromatin. Uh, so I have some comments, uh, I guess, in two directions, one from sort of a basic physics uh, direction, which I think the, the two bookend talks that Arupa already mentioned, the one by Rosen in the beginning and the one we just heard, were really great at sort of setting up the question of, we know that we can make really nice in vitro systems that um, look like complex versions of polymer physics, phase separation, that really look like things we can get a handle on, we can understand quantitatively, we all love that. And then the question becomes, how much do they relate to the in vivo systems that we actually care about from the point of view of biology? And I think those, the, the, those, the, the, the two talks, sort of, well, the one at the beginning, the one at the end, sort of brought that question to the fore in a brilliant way. And so I think that's one of the directions we have to go in. I mean, it's, it's, it's very nice to do polymer physics, but we really want to do biology in a sense at, at the end of the day. Um, so in, in that regard, there are many questions. Uh, I, I guess I still don't quite understand uh, in, in a biological context when I'm supposed to think of some uh, structure as a liquid 
condensate or a liquid phase separated region versus a protein, multi-protein complex. So if I think of the post, just to remove it from the realm of, of uh, chromatin in the nucleus, if I think of the postsynaptic density as a region with many, many different types of proteins, it's not one protein, it's not a simple um, model system, it's a complex system. Uh, am I supposed to think of that as a liquid condensate? Am I supposed to think of that as a organized uh, multi-protein complex where each individual protein has a specific spatial location and a specific set of binding partners? Uh, I don't know the answer, but I think that's a, a sort of fundamental question that I um, still you know, think about whenever I hear talks about, about the, this various subject. Uh, connected to that is the issue of um, does the non-equilibrium nature change some of the features. For example, I think Arup mentioned, and, and, and I think the, the talk from Johns Hopkins on the issue of to what extent coarsening behavior that we would expect in an equilibrium phase separation system, either by uh, cluster, cluster aggregation, or by Oswald ripening or whatever, to what extent those are somehow um, precluded or, or gotten rid of by non-equilibrium effects, I think is still an interesting uh, question, which some people in the room have, have, have worked on. So if I, the other set of comments uh, has to do with, you know, there have been, there are many talks that uh, somewhere along the way in the talk said, we're really interested in the connection of this structure of this dynamics to gene expression. And then that's the sort of final statement in that regard. Now that is, I'm not blaming the talks. I mean, it's, it's you know, you first probably need to understand more about the structural elements at different scales before you can really uh, understand in detail how they affect gene regulation. But my main interest these days is on sort of dynamic systems biology, how networks of genes and networks of RNAs interact with each other dynamically to actually enable cell differentiation, to actually enable uh, changing um, phenotype in a cell under stress. And I, I think this field eventually has a lot to say about that about those processes, but it's not quite there yet. I mean, I still think, you know, gene expression is being used as, a, as it seems to me, as a static indicator of, well, we can look at RNA-seq and we can find regions where the gene is highly expressed and that correlates well with, you know, some type of domain structure as seen in high C. Uh, we can obviously know the separation between heterochromatin and euchromatin. Those are all in some sense static indicators of the correlation between genomic structures at different scales and gene expression patterns. It's not yet at the level of, you know, how dynamically do I have a pioneer factor? It comes in, it opens up chromatin, it calls in the right factors. It dynamically gives rise to a change. How does the interaction of the chromatin degree of freedom together with the sort of transcriptional network degree of freedom actually work to uh, limit the possibilities of state change, whatever. Those are the questions I'm ultimately interested in. And I think, you know, when, when this meeting goes on, I think the Creston will say that we want this meeting to be an ongoing event. I, I would hope that we would see more of an integration of those two fields together uh, in terms of dynamic gene regulation and how that's directly affected by these uh, chromatin structural elements at these different scales. So with that, I thought it was fantastic. I certainly to learn a lot because I knew so little at the beginning. And uh, I thank very much Arup for doing the bulk of the organizing uh, of the effort. Being on an organizing committee with Arup is a very, uh, you get some credit and you do no work. So it's great. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to him. Well, maybe we'll go with Rick first and then uh, Prastan will not get the last word, but the last word for this first round of, um, of comments. Well, with respect to the talks, the striking thing to me was the level of sophistication and polish of the talks from the fellows. I think you all should be commended for the work that you did with those talks, especially in the context of Zoom. You know, it strikes me this meeting was about uh, nuclear processes. And uh, within the last few years, we've come to understand that most nuclear processes are compartmentalized and condensates. And the remarkable feature of these condensates is that uh, they're encompassing regulatory processes that have historically been the subject of detailed genetic, biochemical, and structural studies. So we know a lot about underlying molecular me mechanisms, but now we have this additional 
regulatory level of uh, condensate behavior. And so I think what's interesting is we're integrating a conceptual understanding of a historical molecular biochemical genetic nature and a new biophysical nature that I think is leading to some fundamental changes in the way biologists and even physician scientists are uh, understand how human biology works. So I think we're now in an, uh, an area where physicists and biologists, not to mention chemists and uh, folks who work on artificial intelligence, really have to collaborate to gain deep insights. And I just leave you with uh, four questions for discussion. What are the components of these condensates? We know RNA plays important roles. In the nucleus, DNA is often a component. Proteins are certainly components. But we don't really have a catalog of the components and condensates. What, what are the features of molecules that cause them to partition selectively into those specific condensates? We have for FUS and a few other proteins insights into what has been termed the molecular grammar, the amino acid side chains, the stickers and spacers, the, the ways that we currently think about partitioning behaviors. We need much more understanding of those features. What's that physical chemical environment look like inside a condensate? How does that differ from that outside? If drugs, for example, become concentrated in condensates where their targets lie, is there a different kind of pharmacodynamics we need to study? And, and finally, what are the non-equilibrium events that drive dynamic formation and dissolution of these condensates? I, th I think the answers to these questions are, uh, are well within the command of many of the experimental theoretical systems that have been presented here. So I thought they might be worth further discussion. So thanks, Rick. Krastan? Yeah, so <clears throat> in terms of um, the science, I, uh, I think this was a fantastic uh, symposium. And uh, thank you, Arup, for, and the organizers for organizing this uh, meeting. I want to thank also Sarah, uh, Kelly, and the team at MIT for excellent performance and uh, almost uh, completely flawless uh, meeting. Um, in terms of the science, um, so I, I want to go a little bit back to the late 20s, early 30s of last century, when condensed matter physics was starting to become a field. And condensed matter physics starting, say, with the Ising model, completely developed new physics tools and language, which didn't exist in the physics community before that. Um, I think that we are still in the very early stages of doing this in this field. Um, we are using, and I'm guilty of that too, we are using models that we have developed in other contexts for other systems, as Herbie said, you know, polymer physics. Um, we need to move on theoretically and develop concepts that actually emerge from the system that we are studying. Uh, there will be analogies, of course, and there will be things that probably we already know from other systems. But I expect that um, it, the integration of non-equilibrium uh, physics with networks that are functional, functional networks, will uh, lead to actually new language and new, um, new physics. Um, we are loosely speaking about condensates, probably in different contexts, these are different condensates. And whether they're condensates at all is still a question for me, at least. Um, in, the, uh, in the pea granules, uh, there is a lot of work, as you know, uh, by Cliff and by other people. And they did show to a large extent that these are condensates. Um, that they actually behave like a liquid, that the droplets behave like a liquid. Uh, they dissolve and, and organize. They, we still don't know what drives uh, this pea granule formation. Uh, but these are the questions we want to understand. We want to understand in different contexts, what is the common and what is the difference between these uh, organelles? Uh, and so I, I see the future, in fact, going that direction, more theory, 
working with the wonderful experimental systems that we have. Uh, it's not easy to study them in the, in the cell. Um, <clears throat> again, Cliff and others have developed now uh, multiple model systems where you can optically uh, induce those uh, droplets and uh, dissolve them. But again, what is the role of ATP? Some of these things might, as Herbie said, might be assemblies and not actually, might be aggregates, not condensates, not, not liquid condensates. Uh, they might have to be dissolved as uh, you guys have shown at MIT by ATP driven processes. Um, <clears throat> there is a recent paper by Cliff, uh, again, showing that the phase diagram, the saturation concentration depends on the concentration, which is, uh, was unexpected. Uh, uh, for these systems. Uh, so there are a num number of theoretical questions that we do need to understand. And that's why I would really, as Saruk said, would like this to be annual event. Um, we will have, of course, a meeting in the spring and we, we should discuss uh, with the organizers and with maybe broader range of people, do we need to have another meeting next summer in addition to the March or April meeting, or do we want to skip one year and go for 2022? Uh, but certainly the interest is huge. Uh, people are uh, interested in these problems. Uh, and so I'm very excited. And uh, from my point of view from NSF, uh, at NSF, we are very excited together with my colleagues in MCB of this field. This field is really, really uh, cutting edge uh, field at the, at the interface of physics and biology. And I think that we really have a chance in the next decade to understand these processes and to actually uh, uh, make cellular biology more quantitative than, than it's now. So again, thank you very much. And uh, I'll give it to Arup. So I think what might be good now for a few minutes is to have uh, people who are on the call to contribute to the dis dis discussion. And I personally, and I'm not forbidding others, but I see the first hand uh, the first hand is from a person with lots of gray hair. I would like to see some people participate in this discussion who are not in that category. So having said that, I will uh, let Jose Onicek uh, uh, speak. But okay, I do encourage of... younger people to contribute to the discussion because you are the future. <laughs> Thank you, Arup. Thank you for the organization. It was a great meeting. Uh, thanks, Creston. I think that's a hot topic. We are going all are very, very excited about work with you to have to make this meeting annually. And we thank MCB and the Feast of Living System at the NSF to support this idea. I think the meeting was fantastic. Uh, I think there was a comment by the speakers about uh, some of the talks by the senior people, but I really enjoyed the talks by the young people. Like uh, Arup was saying, I think they really were short talks, but they really brought to the front a lot of the new things. I want to bring a couple of points here. One is that basically, both theoretically and experimentally, we keep talking about structure and function, but structure is a very complicated thing as we come to this sort of chromatin. Basically, all have been common. We did that, but several other people working on it. The idea is you have an ensemble of structures, is a is a structural heterogeneous ensemble, but also dynamical ensemble of structures, and it's very very interesting to understand how to differentiate this ensemble of a single cell type from ensembles of different cell types and try to figure out how, if you look at two particular structures, it's very easy to differentiate them, but you have ensembles basic, which are the proper coordinates. We saw a lot of discussion today about that. It tells you how to identify a cell type based on a structure, not still based on it. And I think the, what you're very interested in is the connection between all the way of epigenetics and structure and dynamics become a very interesting question. And the question of ensembles, what is just fluctuation of a single cell, heterogeneity of a single cell versus difference between different cell types or different organisms. There's a lot of diversity here to be explored. Second, I want to comment what Creston said. I think we have, you're using the word phrase transition and condensates in a very loose way. And I think we really need to quantify that. In which of these cases, these are just dynamical effects that we look at some fluctuation when you have something where the direct connection to phase transition becomes important. Uh, I think particularly have finite systems and we are trying to say, is that a liquid or that's not a liquid? I think you're going to have a lot of uh, different phases of matter come here that they are not be, can be classified on these very simple descriptions we have that I think this problem makes this problem very interesting. So in a certain way, 
I like where Phil and Rick Young were saying about this sort of dynamical new cell biology. There's an interesting, very new biologist coming from it. A lot of understanding how these things work, but the counterpart of it, and that's also goes to a common question made, there's a lot of new physics that's coming from it. So I think it's a win-win situation, basically. We are going to have to learn new basic physics to come from it. I just put the idea on phase transition cell types. So I think it's going to be a rich field, not a field just understand the life science, but also understand this sort of uh, physics of uh, complex systems and the entire thing of non-equilibrium system and networks coming together. So we really need the young people. And I want to thank for the meeting. I'm looking forward for the new version in March and future extensions of this meeting. Thank you. Yeah, so I would like to hear from young people. I might uh, just comment on the last thing that uh, Jose said. I don't want to debate about it, but uh, just to say that, you know, uh, the new physics will come from the kinds of questions that uh, I brought up in my brief, very brief remarks, uh, which were connected to the, some of the issues that Gita brought up. And some of that is beginning to emerge. In any case, uh, young people, we need commentary from young people. <laughs> Don't be shy, please. Arup, Arup, you have to define young before we hear from them. Young people are all people younger than me. OK, so everybody, <laughs> so, half of the meeting is younger than you. And so everybody who's spoken so far is not, except you, Krastan, is older than me. So younger people now. <laughs> <laughs> Great, Zane Thornburg and Michelle DiPiro. So Zane first. Um, so this meeting was very exciting for me as a younger uh, computational graduate student. It's just good to have something this focused on parameters and experimental techniques we care about. Um, so I've been, I'm trying to learn more on eukaryotic systems right now. Right now I mainly work in bacteria, but um, I just find it exciting to have something this focused that delivers new experimental techniques, such as the ones from TJ Haas group that we heard about. And then just the actual, and when we do our simulations, we care a lot about uh, maintaining uh, our use of as many experimental parameters as we can. So the push for measurements of diffusion and uh, affinities and reaction uh, rate constants those sorts of things. Um, this meeting, I think, does, it seems like everyone pushes each other to do a better job at uh, obtaining these measurements, which is very exciting for me on the computational side. Thank you. That's, I think, an important comment. And uh, we'll now go to Michelle DiPiro from Northeastern University. Hi, so I am, um, relatively young, I'm an assistant professor and I'm just starting my tenure track. So in the physics department and I wanted to, okay, first I would like to thank the organizers. This is a great meeting and very, very interesting. And I was very interested to see all the different facets of the problem. My personal interest and in why I'm really excited about this field and you know, I'm setting my lab uh, fully in this domain is uh, the, the new physics because, and there's two things that are interesting to me to the new physics. First is the new physics is gonna be a physics of uh, somewhat liquid, somewhat semi-condensed. So it's, it's, it's the physics of really highly heterogeneous uh, structural ensembles and how we connect that to function as Jose was pointing out, but also as uh, Rick or Herbie were pointing, this physics needs to be a physics that is specific. It's not a physics of every protein. It's a physics of why a certain protein acts in a certain condensate or in a certain way. So I'm really interested in this sort of like moving physics to be uh, more specific to biology. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of challenges in that, both uh, theoretical and computational. I think this is gonna be really a uh, great few years ahead. And uh, yeah, I would love to participate every single year. Thank you. Thank you. Any more commentary and questions, discussion? I think people are getting tired after three and a half days because I can watch people dropping off, but uh, uh, any, any further commentary from those who are on? Well, I 
don't see any further hands coming up or things sent to me by chat. So let me uh, say the following uh, in closing. Uh, as we've all commented, great meeting, very heterogeneous in terms of the areas covered, but all still integrated. And I'm glad you all will be able to participate across the world. Uh, we will definitely have the in-person meeting that we had planned, which will have, uh, with one exception, a distinct set of speakers. And um, we hope to have that when conditions permit. Uh, Rastan pointed out that, and others have too, that they would like to have a meeting following that, either in the summer or the following year. Uh, what I can say for myself is that having played some role in organizing this video meeting and the one that will happen in person in the spring, I will not be organizer or the principal organizer of the next meeting. That I will tell you, but I am sure that others will step in to do that. So on that note, I'll bring this meeting to a close and I thank you all for the participation and it was great. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Cabo. <laughs>